So today I'm going to be talking about design for humans, not robots. So before I kind of dive into this talk, I'd like to set something straight. I'm not saying that robots aren't awesome because they totally are. <laughs> robots are amazing. But beyond the kind of comic book robots, there's this discourse between humans and robots. They're always near human, not quite us. And we have this fascination with robots as humans. We play with them as toys, and we make them in our own image. And we've developed robots with actually emotional states that mimic, that care for us, and even have the robot version of animal-assisted therapy. Digital experiences, though, they've never been very good at being human. They've been robotic. For example, look at errors. They're hardly human in the way that they're written. There's no connection, no humanity. And error messages are normal. It's part of the digital life that we have errors and we have issues. But how they're dealt with is a really great example of how we lack humanity in our interfaces. For example, this one. It says a child died. That's kind of a pretty emotive message if you get this. And yes, it's just a programmatic term, but not everybody knows that. And just seeing those words has an emotive impact. And I was actually faced with this question to confirm whether I was a human and to say I'm not a robot. It might seem fun, but it really struck a chord with me while I was preparing for this talk. If you're put into a position where you need to prove that you're human and not a robot, it's probably not a very good way to have an interface. And then Facebook recently had this rather interesting bug where it managed to put a memorial sign and technically, in its terms, kill off users. So this is kind of a really emotive thing to find on your profile. And beyond being a bug and, and they, they admitted this, if you were searching for someone that you hadn't maybe spoken to in a while or you hadn't had a connection with for a while and you came to their page and saw this, that's going to have some impact on you. This isn't realizing our impact on users, and this isn't thinking about what happens with the experiences we create. I really do think there's a missing part with a lot of us in the education that we have. And in creating experiences, we need to be understanding humans, and we need to study this. Whatever you're doing, understanding humans is really, really important if you're creating experiences that they interact with. It's important for designers, it's important for coders. It's important for anyone. And it's crucial to know at least a little bit of something how humans work. So hands up. Who knows what this is? OK. So this is slide number six in most user experience talks. No, this is actually Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's meant to show what you need to be a happy, healthy human. But there's a problem with this. The problem is that our needs in this are in a very particular mindset for a very particular person, potentially. Now, it may have fitted Maslow, and it may have fitted the research that was done at that time, but it doesn't fit everyone. And it may not have even fitted Maslow his entire life, either. Our needs, our wants, our goals, they change. And whenever we're talking about users, it's crucial to remember that the user isn't you. You're amazing, but it's not about your headspace or your worldview. You can't rely on humans coming in like the model AZ90. We don't come packaged neatly in robot models. We don't come in that package. We are varied, we are diverse, and often humans are just unexpected, and that's OK. Take, for example, someone actually using a device with one hand. Now, maybe that's someone who actually only physically has one hand, but maybe it's a mother holding a baby. Or maybe it's you looking at an iPhone while you're stirring some soup. Think about how many times you've interacted with devices with only one hand. It's quite a lot. And states also change with age. We're aging as a digital use. We're not you know, getting younger doing this, and we're creating these experiences that don't acknowledge that. And our circumstances change. 
our environment. And when you're creating something, you have to really ask yourself, do you use interfaces with 100% attention all the time? I know that I don't. And when you test, we're giving 100% of our attention generally when we do that. But the problem is with that, we're not creating testing environments for the real experiences. Fluid experiences are really essential for us to start creating. And these go towards creating a longevity of a product, which you want if you're creating an experience. And we have to accept that humans change. And beyond that, that we function in different environments. Nobody, not one of us, has a consistent life. And all too often, we assume that that's just what happens. And I think the answer to this will be the same as mine, because none of our lives actually run to a timetable that you can predict every second or every minute of your life. Life happens to us, and we have to create experiences that allow life to happen. And part of it creating experiences that adapt to the users that aren't rigid and fixed, we need to reflect this in how we allow people to interact with that. So I was browsing Medium, for example, and I saw this. And apart from the fact that Medium URLs kind of make me twitch a little bit, because they're just impossible, this message is basically saying that this image is needed for tweeting. Now, it's, it's needed because of the formatting. The formatting looks better if you have an image. But this isn't really having an adaptable format. This is forcing someone to put a pretty picture of a goat, but a picture of a goat, just to have that when they do this. And it's great that Medium let you tweet out and have pictures and have a little bit of personalization, but requiring for certain things, that's really just not a flexible interface. I'd really like to suggest this book, Design for Real Life. And if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it. It talks about a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today, but it also talks about other things as well. And in an interview, Sarah actually said that we need to change our wording and thinking about edge cases. And this, when we talk about edge cases, and I think I've done this, and I think everybody does this when you're creating interfaces, you're saying that it's fringe when you use the word edge. And it really shouldn't be. You need to think about it as stress cases, and that's what they say. And it's really important because when you attach that word to something, it becomes a lot more important for you to fix. So the question, and what I'm going to address a little bit in this talk today, is how do you design for humans? Well, by understanding them, by creating graceful, empathic experiences. And we have to recognize that as humans, we need to connect. And that's not just with other people. We also need to connect with the experience and get feedback. We need social experiences. We're actually social animals. That's part of our makeup. And we need these interactions beyond the simple point and click and no feedback. There's this amazing thing that happens to us as humans when we see a smile. We have these neurons that actually kick off in our brain, and it makes us happy. That's kind of amazing. I kind of think of us as primates needing a hug. And that's my visual image that I use when I'm creating experiments. We need that neuron hit. We need those feedback. Emotional connections are powerful. When we do those aptly, we create incredible, memorable experiences. Take this site. It's about Alzheimer's, and it actually fades unless it's fed with memories. And it drills down. Every single one of these dots, as you go closer, is a memory. And you can zoom in and then in more, till eventually you can see each memory. And then you can click on the memory and view what that person wrote. It's impactful. It recognizes the fragility and the experience. And it's a connection that goes beyond that simple pixel, that point and click, and that coldness that we all too often experience from the digital. In contrast, but equally, something like this. You can't but help pass on a good experience as a human. Going back to remembering that we're social animals, we want to share. That's part of us. This urge for us to feel good and make others feel good. And whilst we might not feel it all the time, we're actually happy by nature. 
It releases chemicals when we make someone else happy. And that's pretty cool. It's a win-win for humanity when we do this as well. Making something like this that has to be passed on, that you just get that urge to just share it, that's great. That's how these memes work. And if we can't but help pass on a good experience, if you think about what happens with a bad experience, exactly the same thing. Because when we pass on, we get feedback, we get sympathy, we get relations, we get all that kind of comforting of, oh my goodness, you felt so bad, and someone won't go through it again. All those kind of feelings come to us. And when we create something, I think we really want it to be for a good reason that we have that, not for the negative reason. So, has anyone in this room ever lost their keys? So, okay. I've lost keys, wallets, lots of different things. Uh, whenever I do, I first of all try and imagine where I was before. I trace my initial steps. Uh, I always have a key pop. I always go there because I lose them quite often. And if they're not there, I then generally go rummaging through the sofa. I'll try. I'll be finding all my steps. I'll be going through it. And as each step that I go through, this kind of fog of frustration is zoning in. And I'm not thinking very clearly. Um, I'm not knowing what I'm doing. I'm getting very frustrated. And my vision is getting smaller because of that, because of that, that feeling that I just don't know, and I don't know where they are. So a couple of weeks ago, I actually lost my wallet. And because of this kind of cloud of frustration, I didn't know what I was doing. And only hours later, when I went into a room, did I see it lying on the floor, when I wasn't in that fog. And I'd searched that room. I knew what I was doing. But because I had that tunnel vision, I couldn't find it. So we don't cope very well when we have frustration. Humans really aren't built for that. And we can't use experiences when we feel this. The problem is a lot of interfaces are encouraging that mindset or a portion of that mindset. So it's just inevitable that users aren't going to be able to use the experience properly or we're going to get a bad experience. So when things change without obvious reasons, we have the same issue of frustration that I was talking about with the keys. And to compound that, it's also if things change too many at the same time, we just don't know what's going on. We don't know where the furniture is in this interface. If this and that recently changed the word recipes to applets, now, it may feel a little bit weird that they did that, but maybe they had some user research that said that that would be a better word. I don't know. I'm not privy to that. However, they also changed a lot of the interface, and they kind of moved things around a little bit. So they had those two problems. And on top of that, they had this URL, thin WTF. So I'm frustrated. I don't know what I'm doing on this interface. And then, I mean, it's funny that they have WTF as a URL, but it makes me feel I'm kind of being made fun of for being frustrated and not knowing what I'm doing. And it might seem cute and it might seem fun, but it doesn't to all users. And we have to think about that feeling and remember what we feel like when we lose something and we're frustrated. One other part of thinking about designing for humans is that robots are absolutely fine about being part of a collective, as the Borg has taught us. However, we aren't as human beings. We like to feel unique. We like to feel special. We like to feel that the experience is created just for us. And that's kind of cool that we can do that. If you go back in time and you think of cave drawings, or you think of graffiti, or I know I did it, drawing on my folder or putting stickers on at school, and even tattoos, how we adorn ourselves, how we mark ourselves and our identity. There's this real need for us to make things our own and to be recognized by our name as well. Personalizing an experience is really, really important. If you know someone's name, then use it. Don't refer to them as a model name. But there's a little bit of caution here, and there's a caution with a lot of what I'm going to say. Don't do it in a creepy way. There's a fine line between being a stalker and a friend. And if you, someone agrees, then show their username. But allow them to change it to be what they want. It's their identity, so they should be able to be referred to however they want to be referred to. Predicting, also, when done in a natural, non-creepy way, 
can be really impactful. For example, I was searching for a customer service phone number, which normally is an indication I'm going to lose half an hour of my life diving into forms, getting completely lost. However, I typed this in, and it came up straight away with the Virgin Media number. Awesome. I could phone this number. It was great. I didn't have any worries. Customer service is notoriously normally difficult to find, so this is refreshing. And I thought, well, what happens if I do this in Google? Well, I did this. It didn't demand any extra information from me. It just popped up, and that was a really good way of doing it. But again, have to be a little bit careful. Don't ask for personal details when they're not needed. Gender only matters in a very few cases, and all too often we ask for someone's gender on a form, or we ask for someone's, that we just don't need those extra bits of information. When you ask details, also remember that humans don't fit into boxes. Allow humans to be the diverse, interesting people that they are. Allowing someone, even a team, to take that application and then mix in their own specialness is really great. It's a really great way of allowing bonding and ownership of a team. For example, Slack here, you can add custom emojis. And whilst it might seem frivolous, it's a great way for a team to unite. Maybe there's a certain, when you launch something, there's a certain happy dance emoji. Something happens. And being personal and showing that it goes beyond the actual interface into showing how the product was made. You really need to show that it was made by humans, show the people that created this. For example, in Vimeo, you see the faces of the people that did this. There's something really powerful in seeing who made that experience. And we have this in the non-digital life as well. If you think of when you go and maybe buy some, a cake or something, and you know the baker, and you know how that was made. There's something in that story. Or maybe knowing the heritage of a handcrafted item. There's something in us humans that really crave that and really feel comforted by that. One thing above all that I want you to take away from this talk and try and focus a little bit on is the big thing that I think is lacking from our interfaces and our experiences digitally, which is just simply respect. Respect is a drive and value to every human. Just like in real life, in a digital one, respect should be central to everything that we're creating. And it's crucial to be respectful to users of their time, of their space, and of their, quite simply, everything. They are valued. They are choosing to interact with your experience. So be respectful to them. You'd be respectful to another human being face to face, so be respectful to them digitally. Respect comes in understanding also the patterns of behavior. So look at this form. This is not showing any understanding of that. The asterisks are literally reversed. Normally, an asterisk is a required thing, but optional fields are denoted by an asterisk. This form, thankfully, doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> However, you just have to think how many people will call out by this. Because we have that pattern, we have that expected behavior to do. And forms are a really easy way of finding lack of respect digitally. This time, the sheer size and this easy reset button, a feature I can only imagine, uh, shows no value placed on users' time. Yes, there are extensions that can save you from contents vanishing on forms, but only accessible to a, they are only accessible to a knowledgeable few. Most users don't use Chrome extensions. Getting out of that headspace, the fact that well, we have it, so therefore we know, that's not what most users do. And too much animation in the form of these crazy micro-interaction festivals that quite simply shows a lack of respect of users' time. Yes, it's cute and amazing that we can do all of this now with animation, but if it takes too long to be usable, it's just not great. For example, an overly animated shopping cart, that's just not usable. It's not a full feature cartoon, it's a shopping cart. You just want to check out. Experiences really need to focus on people wanting to use them, not having to use them. And I think far too often we've just accepted that, oh, well, someone's got to use that. When you're forced to do something as a human, we're a little bit grumpy 
and we start off on the wrong path and in the wrong mindset. When we have to jump through tech queues, for example, that's the same thing. A great example of that for me is modern web development. The amount of tech hoops that I have to go through is incredible, and it doesn't put me in a good mindset to do that. If people want to use something, to have that emotional connection and that bond is really, really important. Going back to understanding humans, if you understand that, you're going to make a better experience. If you think a little bit about how brands and people go back to them years and years and years and then pass on to their children, we don't do that digitally, but we need to change our mindset to have that because we're going to be around for a while. When you're talking about humans, that bond, there's one thing that's really important in that, and that's a sense of delight. Delight is powerful. And whilst I was a little bit flippant about cute earlier, I'm not against cute experiences. I love cute things. But my perception of cute and what delights me, that's not what delights you or anyone else in the room. Part of human nature is to look for these sense of delight, these little moments and seek out our positive. Going back to them, because I think they're a great example of how we do this wrong, error messages also <laughs> often had these cuteness about them. And there's a problem with that. Often when they do that, you lose the actual information. And it's about a balance between giving a robotic error message and giving something that's too cute and not giving enough information. How you handle messages says a really an awful lot about the experience and respect that you have for the user. And if you know that a setting and you're seeing that users are doing it time and time again, then make it the default. Make a user's experience easier from the start of interacting. One thing I think there's not enough of in the world is helping UI. And what I mean by that is UI that helps you level up as you go. For example, this is WordPress.com. On entering the customizer for the first time, it guides you through the experience. And you click icons, just like there's going to be in core, so you can see where the elements are. And you even have this handy little extra link to documentation so you can find out help. The help isn't being hidden. You don't have to read a manual, or you don't have to go in some great FAQ just to be able to use something. It's there in front of you. And a great thing you can do with users is help them to level up with hints and tips along the way. Grow the user's ability to interact with the experience whilst they interact. And that's about being respectful with their time, making it contextual and not a manual that they have to sit down and read before they go, or this giant wizard that they have to go through just to get the experience. They're there, they're interacting, and they're able to get that information. So Isaac Asimov actually wrote The Three Laws of Robotics. I don't know if anyone knows that, um, but they kind of started out as a fictional, but they've now been adopted as, as something that a lot of people refer to. And in writing this talk, I began to think about how these could actually be converted to experiences. So there is a really need to create these experiences that allow us to be the best humans, not the worst that we currently are. What would the three laws of designing for humans look like? And the language that I'm going to use reflects his language, so it's a little bit verbose in places, but I'd like to share them with you. So rule one, an interface may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. Harm is emotional. And I think this is something we really need to understand, that we shouldn't be doing that to people. Rule number two, an interface must obey orders given to it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. It should just work. In this sense, you shouldn't have to hunt for things, you shouldn't have to read a manual, you shouldn't have to do all these long, verbose things just to get it. And then finally, rule three, which I think is incredibly important if I refer back to if this and that. An interface must protect its own existence as long as such a protection doesn't conflict with the first or second law. It shouldn't just vanish or disappear. We really... And these are kind of a joke, three laws, but I think they're also appropriate for us to consider whenever we're creating those experiences. When we design for humans, not robots, we make experiences that connect, that are powerful, that matter, that cause less stress. 
Now, I'm not actually saying that when you're creating an experience, you're going with the mindset to cause someone stress. I don't believe that. But unintentionally, you do that when you design for robots, not humans. We have created a web that unfortunately brings out the worst nature in us. And I don't know about you, but that's actually not a place that I want to be to function. And it's a place that I feel I have to function in. And that doesn't feel right to me. The simplest of tasks brings us frustration, causes us stress. And the good news is we can change this. If we design for humans in all our variety, then we start changing the experience. A little bit more human, the experience becomes as we do one by one. It's powerful and it adds up. So let's design for humans, not robots. So thank you. So any questions? Sorry, I didn't see you right back there. I apologize. Have we got microphones for people? Or? <laughs> OK. So finding those stress cases is, hmm? yeah, OK. Oh, whew. it's a long question. Uh, <laughs> so to kind of summarize, um, you're asking how do you find the stress cases? And then how do you design around them? Is that, that's kind of what you're saying, yes? That's absolutely what I'm saying. There you go. OK, cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the big answer is user test. So you're not going to find the stress cases generally yourself. Well, you are for you using the experience and using the experience in different places. You're going to find some, but you're going to find some with your headspace. What you really need to do is do lots of user testing, be very wide about that user testing as well. And often when you're designing something, you'll think, oh, well, that won't happen because just a few people. Well, those, that's exactly when you should write down when you have that thought and know that you're going to like, work that into it. How you design to avoid those is just by remembering also, as you create each experience, remembering those times each time you do it. So in the previous times you've done experiences. And also by just avoiding them when you see it in a user test, trying to make a way around that. Uh, but you need to see them to design for them. I encourage everyone to do something. It's a term, not a very really great term, but called dog fooding. So use your own products. Start just exploring them and just use a test. If you're not, if you're creating something and you aren't user testing widely and you aren't observing people using that product, then I really encourage you to do that. So, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Any other questions? And I'll try and see you this time. Hi. <laughs> Okay, so generally when I do user tests, I'll set a boundary of numbers. Um, I would just say user test often. Just user testing at the end doesn't really help you creating something. Um, there's a user research phrase at the beginning where you would maybe do surveys, you do user testing, you'd watch the existing situations, you'd also do benchmarking. Uh, but it really depends on what you're making and what set works for you, like the number. Um, from the time that it's put in, you're going to have to put a time limit. Um, Use, if you're doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, user testing, that takes a long time to do. If you're observing it, it still takes a long time to process. Uh, there's no magic number. 
of this is the number and then it always passes user testing. It's really up to your product and the time that you have as well. Any? Hi. Hold on. Let's use the mic. <laughs> Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, what did you mean by vanishing interfaces in rule three, I think? <laughs> uh, by vanishing interfaces? Yep. Uh, so say someone was using a form and a button was in a certain place, and then you did version two where the button moved to a completely different place. That's a vanishing interface. Or some functionality that they could always do on your site. Maybe they could always put a header image. And then suddenly you decide, you know what, we're not going to have header images anymore. There's probably a good reason why you didn't, you just didn't flippantly say that. But the user would expect either there to be information of, you can't do header images no more, but da-da, you can do background images. Or, you know, some way of guiding them through. Um, interfaces change, interfaces develop, because you should be user testing and adapting to feedback. So when you do do changes, either bring them in, trickle them in, or guide someone through that new experience. I've seen some great re-onboarding. So we always talk about NUX or the new user experience. Well, sometimes you need to have that because a new, an interface changes. So there's like a second or third new user experience where you adapt and onboard again. Um, try not to change everything, but <laughs> the, you know things change. And I don't know, it depends on the product. So. Um, <clears throat> I think often when you get into advanced functionality, that's where poor design gets introduced. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the utility of creating that advanced design versus keeping it simple? I mean, there's a purpose sometimes for that advanced design or functionality. So I think keeping it simple is used as a, as a blanket statement, but keep it simple in terms of what it has to do is probably more appropriate. So some things are just complex to do. Um, applying for a visa, that form's incredibly complex. <laughs> um, whether I want it to be or not, uh, that's just the way it is. But there's ways to ease that. Um, and I think the keeping it simple blanket statement should be keep it simple as it's appropriate. And also keep it simple even though it's complex is very important. You know, guide and all those kind of things. I don't think that uh, overcomplication sometimes is bad. Absolutely, you should, you should never overcomplicate something. But some things are complicated. And I think we have to accept that and not be dismissive of, um, there's the phrase with stupid at the end, which I think is not particularly good uh, because it's saying blanketly that we should keep it simple. And I think we should keep it appropriately simple. Um, things happen complexity interface-wise. Okay. Hey, how's it going, Tammy? Good. Um, so I had a question about uh, edge cases. Uh, is it ever appropriate to approach an edge case uh, in a way where, uh, instead of just creating a situation where you know, an interface works well at the edge, um, is it ever appropriate to drive the user away from the edge case and basically kind of use it to steer the user back to not using the edge case? Um, does that make sense? Mm, I think it depends whether they... So edge cases, you're, you're actually... That's a good point you're saying. It doesn't have to be because it's a particular user type. An edge case could be that they're just... Oh, this is completely random. They're, they're, they're using it in a particular way. Um, and really, like you shouldn't be applying for a passport when you're trying to go up an escalator. I don't know, something really, <laughs> really random. Um, I think people use things in different ways, and you can try and encourage them away from using them in a certain place, uh, but they're going to do it. If they're, if they're even an edge case, it's, it's a stress case. So I just think it's about recognizing it and making it easier at that point. I would highly doubt you can eliminate all stress cases, and that's why stress is better than edge case, um, another reason, because you're easing the stress as well as, yes, you want to remove it, but sometimes you need to ease the stress. You're not going to be able to fully remove that stress because some people are going to use things in that situation. Um, I'm kind of against forcing someone to have to do something in a certain way or even guide them to do that, because I just accept that humans are excitingly random. 
And it's just, I mean, if you stop someone doing or herd them away from doing it in one particular way, they're just going to do it in another way that was equally or even worse random. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think, I think it's about just, again, easing. It's very difficult. I'm not saying any of this is easy. And it's like the next step in what we do creating interfaces. I don't think, I think it's very, very easy to just create how we did, maybe not thinking about users, maybe doing two or three user tests. Um, maybe a little bit of a survey, but to take that extra step and really focus on making these experiences the best they can be for humans is not easy at all. But it's something we really need to do if we want people to stick around with this web, if we want to humans to just be happier and interact better. So there's, uh, there's one right at the back. Thank you. So I technically don't need this. I was the one yelling from back here. <laughs> but um, So I've got another question for you. Um, I love users, and I love making sure that the users have a great experience on the site and making everything delightful. But um, usually I'm hired by business interests who have business goals. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'd like to, to hear your insight on is whenever talking to the people who hire me to build websites and build those uh, web experiences, what language, what different te tips and techniques can you um, kind of advise us to use when talking with them to help them understand the importance of user-centric design and delightful design um, whenever, because sometimes it's at odds with the business goals. Yeah. I think the simple answer is get them to feel it. Uh, if someone is, is not using their product, is not experiencing their product, and doesn't see the user test, they're not going to understand it. They're just going to see the, the, the accountancy side of it, the business side of it. It's really about trying to get someone to connect. Saying that, that feedback, that, that connection. If you watch an emotional movie, you get the emotional feedback. So watching a user test is something so powerful about watching a video of a user getting completely stuck and horrible. I hate it because the fact is that users have that bad experience. But that bad experience can make such change when someone feels it. Um, before I worked at Automatic, I used to use that. Uh, and I frequently had that. I'd go in, I was working on communities, and I was creating designs that would take a long time. And it was like, no, we need to deliver this on budget. And people weren't understanding why we need to do a lot of user testing. But when you do testing on things, and you can show that people are getting stuck, and people can make that connection, they don't question it. They really don't, because they can feel it. So it's all about you trying to make them, not trying to make them feel bad, but kind of trying to make them feel bad as well. And <laughs> trying to make someone feel that connection and feel that user's frustration. It's not easy. It's really not, because you're talking about a lot of fluffy, ethereal things sometimes, and you're using a lot of emotional words that don't necessarily always apply in business. But if you can show data as well of people that are going on and then just going away from the site. They can't deny that someone's having a problem getting through a certain point. Uh, one a good way is to put stack gathering at particular points and find where the fallout points are. If you do that, people are going to clock on, I'm losing users this way. No problem. Any more questions? So, that, that really depends on your circumstances. Uh, so at Automatic, I'm very lucky we have a data team. Uh, I'm very lucky that I can rely on that. Uh, outside, uh, there's a lot of different stat getting from, uh, that you can do. But also, um, from a video perspective, just physically showing a video. Um, I love ScreenFlow, um, but also usertesting.com. No, I wouldn't say do all your user testing on usertesting.com, uh, and it does cost. But actually, those videos are great. They, they have a really great interface for doing annotation. And it's a good way to just do some quick user tests. And you can change the pool. But there's a, there's a lot of options out there. It's really what is appropriate for you to do out there. One-on-one -on -one is also the best way of doing this, just recording someone's screen while they're using it. But try not to be an influence. Um, I'm, unless you're doing a user interview, and this is kind of getting into a lot of the user testing side, which is a talk in itself. You have to be careful about your influence on someone. So if you're sat there breathing down their neck while they're using something, probably going to get a little bit of a different <laughs> results to if you just let them use it with a script. 
Um, so really up to you. Just, just showing a video is so powerful. Uh, animated GIFs are also equally powerful. If it's a small thing, just a, you know, moving screenshots are great for showing a flow and, and the pain points in a flow. But showing a video of someone, um, highlighting the mouse when you do that. So certain videos they just take and they won't sh necessarily show the mouse. So showing where they click, showing how they hover, showing how long they're on things. That's, that's just a great way of doing that. <laughs>